as we abide in you. Lead us, O Lord and Savior, as you abide in me.
He's a, he's a lover. He's a lover of your presence. Read James chapter 4 sometime really slow. You'll find out that he boils over with jealousy over you. I mean, he says you're the apple of his eye. That's the, that's the pupil. And you know, when something comes out your eye, your eyelid closes automatically to protect that apple. You're the apple of his eye. Hallelujah. Let's praise the Lord. Cyril, why aren't you up praying over the offering? Where did Cyril go? Is it over there? You got to have a microphone, brother. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Be ready. In season, no the season. Praise the Lord. Dear Father, we come to you right now. Dear Father, give me thanks and glory, Father, for another wonderful evening and being the host of the Lord. We thank you, Father, for the offering that is being taken up, Father. We ask you, dear Father, to bless those who give, bless those who couldn't give, dear Father. We ask you to multiply back to them, dear Father, press down, shaking together, and running over 
Amen, dear Father. We've been so good to us. We thank you, dear Father, for the word that's coming forth tonight, dear Father. We'll freshen us, dear Father. We'll build us up, dear Father, and get us together and get us in shape and get us in love, dear Father God, because we need it, we need it, we need it, we need it badly. So let our hearts be open, let our minds be open, and let the word come through. In Jesus' praise we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> what are you laughing about, Pastor Nancy? Never, no need to explain. <laughs> Let's turn our Bibles to John, uh, to John chapter 5. <laughs> because we've been talking about faith. And really, the Bible says that this is the word of faith that we preach. So it's, it's all faith. So it's easy to find a place to get started. But in John chapter 5, I got sidetracked a little bit today because, um, and I'm going to sidetrack you for a minute as well. Because lots of times we read the Bible and we know it's a Bible of history and, uh, you know, future events, of course, are there, but it's a book for every day of your life. And, and I think sometimes the reality of the word and the accuracy of the word kind of escapes us because we, we like the guy that we're going to identify here in, Luke, in John chapter 5. We get, sometimes we just get caught up in a mess. We get um, this particular guy find himself in bed for 38 years. Now, many of you know that's not a, that's not a, that's not a good thing? I, I found since the time change, I'd settle for another hour, but um, <laughs> that hour, really, I don't know. I, it's not my confession. I didn't confess it on myself, but I noticed that I kept waking up an hour earlier than I should have and then fighting to get back to sleep. And then when you get back to sleep, a coma sets in. <laughs> so... So there's that adjustment that you have to make. But in John chapter 5, the thing I noticed about John, the, the Gospel of John, and I remember when I taught eschatology, like the seven festivals that God taught his people to celebrate each year, the spring and the fall festivals, identifying the birth, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, and the coming of the king, and setting up the millennial kingdom and all that in those festivals in Luke chapter, in, in Leviticus rather, chapter 23. The Gospel of John goes from one festival to another to another as you read through the Gospels. And in, in chapter 5, it's, a, it's called the Feast of the... Verse 1, it calls it the Feast of the Jews. And so indicating to us that it wasn't any of the seven festivals that he had set up. This was one that they introduced uh, from the book of Esther, right? And so when I read that today, I went back into the book of Esther and so... I need to take you back there just for a minute. It's got nothing to do with tonight's message. This is just, I guess, what, what would you call it? Uh, an hors d'oeuvre. An hors d'oeuvre. <laughs> well, you know, this is happy hour at New Covenant Ministries Church. I, I notice that people go to happy hour on their way home from work, and, and so we're happy here every hour. I can't think of anything I'd rather be doing than studying the Word of God. But the book of Esther is known as the book of the unmentioned God. Because when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found every book except the book of Esther because God's name is not mentioned in there at all. And see, if God's name is not mentioned, it can be destroyed. But the Hebrew people, man, when they wrote down the name, you could not ever destroy that. And that's why we have such a good record, a historical record of the Word of God. You could, I mean, his name was so holy that lots of times they'd go take a bath before they'd write the name and then take another bath afterwards. I mean, these guys were serious about, and that's why Jesus, when he said, I'm giving you my name, we kind of yawn, but to them, it's the power of attorney. To them, it's like, it's like you know, Jacob laying hands, uh, laying hands on, um, on uh, who did Jacob lay his hands on? <laughs> Wasn't me. <laughs> Huh? No, no, I'm I'm back. I'm too far. It was I'm way too far. I'm thinking about Jacob and Esau. And it was Isaac that laid his hands on and laid his hands on Jacob instead of Esau, and how bent out of shape Esau was because he missed the 
laying on of hands. We don't even think about that that much. You get prayed for on a, on a Sunday or Thursday, and you can say, well, you know, whatever. But, you know, the Bible shows that there's an exchange that takes place. And when you put faith in the exchange, you get the, you get the results. So that's why Esau said, I'm not going to rest until I kill my brother Jacob. And that spirit is still going on in the Middle East to this day. So anyways, the book of the unmentioned God. And so it's kind of like when you don't feel his presence. It's kind of like when you don't hear his voice. Have you ever, never been there? Say yes, you've been there at least once. Please help me. Hallelujah. I'd feel backsliding if you didn't nod your head at least something. But over and but now the book of Esther is interesting because it's an anti-Semitic book. There was a guy, you know, Artaxerxes, I think Ezra after Artaxerxes the second was in, for those of you that really care, was in rule in Babylon at the time. And the Jews were flourishing there under Mordecai. So he's the leader of the Jews and they were doing really well. But this guy came along with an Adolf Hitler type spirit. His name was Haman and Haman decided he wanted to kill all the Jews. And so he set up a deal and he worked the deal uh, for several chapters. He worked on it and he even built a gallows where he was going to kill them all. And then over in uh, chapter 9, in chapter 9, everything turned around. In chapter 8 and chapter 9, we find out that Haman got killed on his own gallows. And to you and I, it's a type of your enemy building a trap for you. But Romans 8, 28, see, when we're talking about faith, think about Romans 8, 28, all things are working together for your, your good. Like, you know, there was somebody in the office the other day upset about the rainbows on the sidewalks. You know, celebrate them. They're your covenant, man. Your covenant. Don't get all bent out of shape over stuff like that. Why? Because in Psalm 2, the Bible says that the Lord sits in the heavens and laughs. So why am I going to get, why am I going to let something like that ruin my day? You, you know, I have a message. I have a message to preach, and it's good news. It's not, it's not any of that, right? And so, and so anyway, uh, here's, here's Haman. He made, he made, and I don't want to get into the book of Esther, it's not my message tonight, but, but read it sometime because you'll find out that he had maneuvered and manipulated leadership so that he could get to the place where he'd have a place, a position of power, and then he made laws uh, that were against the Hebrew people, just like laws are being passed right now against the church. Uh, but it doesn't matter because the gallows are being built for you, but somebody else is going to hang on them. But anyway, my, my point for tonight is uh, they killed Haman, and then Haman had 10 sons. And their names are listed here in, uh, in uh, chapter 9. In verse 6, it says that they were in the Sichuan Palace. Uh, the Jews came and destroyed 500 men. But then he lists the 10 sons of Haman that are going to be hung on the gallows. And the reason why I wanted to point it out to you tonight is because in 1946, in Nuremberg, Germany, there was the Nuremberg Trials. And there were 12 anti-Semitic uh, Germans that under, under Adolf Hitler that were on trial. Well, Gorman committed suicide, and then... And then Herman, Herman Goring and Martin, Martin Borman committed suicide. I wrote their names down in my Bible because I want to remind myself every time I see it, this is a book for today. So Martin Borman committed suicide. Hans Frank, William Freck, Herman, uh, Alfred Joel, Ernest Kattenburner, Wilhelm Kaiser, Alfred Rosenberg, Fritz Suckel, uh, Arthur Sag Inquart and Julius Steicher were all committed to die on Purim 1946. And Steicher, just before the gallow doors opened to hang him, yelled out, Purim 1946. And when you read this Hebrew text, Nuremberg is in there several times woven into the scripture. And when I read it, I think about what, what Solomon said in, in chapter 1 and verse 9. The thing that has been is the thing that will be, and there's nothing new under the sun. 
And so, but these guys, these guys were trying to kill off the Jews two years. Come on, just a few, 1948, they went back into the land of Palestine. May 14th, 1948, the Bible says, will a nation become a nation again in one day? Yes, May 14th, 1948. But before it happened, Satan tried to kill them all off in Auschwitz and other places. Just like in this day, he tried to kill them all off, but instead they had a major breakthrough. And that's my message for you tonight. All kinds of enemies against you. The church has never been. I mean, they're getting ready to pass a law now so that they can look into your bank accounts. You don't have a right to look in your bank accounts. Those are the kind of laws they're passing. But I just go back and read some of these stories. I read some of these stories and I think, hmm, it's not going to upset my day. Ah. So now let's go to Luke, or John, rather, John chapter 5. It sidetracked me, and so I wanted to sidetrack you for a minute before we get into the message, and so that's what we did. But, but again, the, the accuracy of the Bible. So if he says he's always going to cause you to triumph in Christ, you, you, you ought to pull that thumb out of your mouth, especially if it's all wrinkled up because it's been there a while. You know, <laughs> you know. This is the day the Lord has made. I rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, we were just, we were just Mary, we was marrying today. Ariel's mother today. We were with her for a little while in the hospital this afternoon. Some of the stuff that she went through. And she's more cheerful than some of the people I see on Sunday. Anyway, not in this church, but in other churches I go to when I'm not around here. <laughs> yeah. I know. But the Bible says, fight the good fight of faith. But you know what? You better fight. <laughs> you can't take this laying down. <laughs> this is what we're going to find about this guy we're going to read about here. It says, now there was at the, in Jerusalem a sheep market in a pool called Bethsaida, having five porches. And in there lay a great multitude of people, impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Because tradition said that when the water bubbled, the first people in would get healed. But it wasn't all that great because Josephus, Flavius Josephus, the historian of the day, didn't even mention it in any of his writings. It was really just a pagan bath, and it was a pagan medicine place, and it was a place more of witchcraft and superstition than anything else. And it even says in verse 4, it says, and the angel went down at a certain time to trouble the water. But come on, you think God's like that? <laughs> I'm going to trouble the water here. And the first one gets in, gets healed, and the rest of you, ha, <laughs> ha. It's not the character of God, you know. So when you read it, you just... just and and remember, remember what he said to the woman that had been bowed over 18 years. He said, ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, be loosed from her infirmity? Therefore, these were all covenant people, and they had no business laying there waiting for a miracle. You see, because here's what happens, and it happens in your life and in my life too. When, you know, when you study, you know, the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, and you see a bunch of people that were taken out of slavery, like I don't know what your slavery was, mine was alcohol and drugs, what, what you were brought out of, so you got born again, but then you go into this wilderness place where you're supposed to learn faith. And when you're in the wilderness, I don't know, sometimes you learn some things and sometimes you don't learn much, but it seems like they went from miracle to miracle, to miracle. And so they were just living on barely get enough and just trying to get along. And God was trying to get them out of just enough and just barely getting by and living by miracles over into a promised land where they could stand on their own two feet, Hallelujah. where they could make a life for themselves, you know. And so, and so here we are. Here's this guy. Let's take a look at him for a minute here. It says in a certain season, the, the water got troubled, and whoever was first troubled in, in troubling the water stepped in, was made whole from whatsoever disease he had. So obviously, there were some things happening here, or, you, or there wouldn't be a, a multitude hanging around there, <laughs> you know. But whether it was God or not, I'm suspicious, <sighs> because there's lying signs and wonders too, you know. So, But anyway, not to get into that, that's not the point of the message. There was a certain man there that had an infirmity 38 
years. Now, with, when, when I'm a Hebrew and I understand numerology, if I'm going to read a number, I know that there's a meaning, and there's also the law of a double reference or the first reference. So when I read 38, I'm going to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 2. I'm going to take you back there with me. Deuteronomy, where did I say? Chapter 2. Verse um, 13, it says, Now rise up and get over the brook Zered. And they went over the brook. And in the space which came, they came to Kardesh Barnea on, and over the brook Zered, 38 years until the generation of all the men of war were wasted from among the host as the Lord sworn unto them. Now, you, if you just read this, you're thinking, God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you all off. But if you don't go back and read, you know, Numbers chapter uh, 12 and 13 and 14, you don't understand what's really taking place here. They said, would to God that we had died in the wilderness. And he said, as you have spoken into my ear, so shall it be unto you. But as surely as I live, my glory will cover the earth, even as the waters cover the sea. You just missed it by, your, by, by cursing it with your own words. And so they cursed themselves to death. God didn't kill them. But it says in verse 16, so when all the men of the war were consumed and dead from among the people, the Lord spoke and the, the Lord began to speak. And so when I read this, then I go back to John chapter 5 and I realize that, that when he's talking 38 years here, he's talking about his own people being, being in, in that place of, of, of lying around waiting for a move of the Spirit of God, right? So... So it says, uh, and when Jesus saw him, he, he said, how long, how long have you been here? And, and he told him, he said, would you be made whole or would you rather like sympathy and would you rather like all the attention you get from, from your situation? Do you really want to change or do you just want sympathy and pity for the situation that you found yourself in for 38 years? He had to ask that question because sometimes people in wheelchairs stay in wheelchairs because they like having doors open for them. It's sad truth, sad truth. Would you be made whole? And the important man answered and said, look at this, I I have nobody. I, I've been lying here on my bed of excuses for so long now. It may work for other people, but it never works for me. This is what he's going to say. When the water gets troubled, I don't have anybody to, to, to put me in. Oh. <laughs> Some people step right down over me. So, you know, he's pessimistic. Somebody's always ahead of him. No one will ever help me. I'm so unworthy anyway, and I'm so unlovable. I'm so full of excuses. I've been here so long. I've got myself, I have a mindset. I'm a victim. Would to God that we had died in the wilderness. Would to God that we could get back to Egypt. Would to God, would to God. A victim mentality instead of seeing victory. See, and you've never been around people that are negative all the time? If you're, am I? This guy was so, he said, I'm so useless. I'm, I'm so sinful. I'm so, I, who knows what he saw. All he was saying was, I don't have anybody to help me. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. I'm all alone in the world. God loves everybody else, but something about me really ticks him off. Oh, well, it always works for other people, but I guess this is just the way it's always going to be for me. And there in Deuteronomy 30 and 19, in Matthew 12 and verse 37, in Proverbs 18, 20 and 21, 
life and death in the power of the tongue, and they that love it will eat the fruit that it bears, whether it's good or bad. I set before you this day life and blessing, death and cursing. Choose life that you and your seed may live. You will be judged by every unproductive argos word that you speak. Only by your words will you be justified. Only by your words will you be condemned. What are you saying? Mark chapter 5. Well, see, no, see, this was somebody waiting on a miracle, waiting for God, waiting for God to do something in his life. And by the mercy of God, Jesus came by and healed that one person and then went off to the Feast of Purim, left all the multitude there. And when you read it in the Greek, it says, he escaped. He escaped. And I thought about what I heard Bill Johnson talking about one time. You know, he's saying that if, if, if God empowered you to heal everybody that you ever prayed for of cancer, within 30 days your life would be wiped out because they'd be coming here in planes with bucket loads of money and coming from all over the world trying to get a hold of you, and it would destroy you. Jesus picked his targets, but the point of healing that one man wasn't to leave the rest of them there to die. That's not who he is. It was to give them a, give them, he, you know, what he said to the man, he did, what he said to the man, he didn't, he didn't put the man in the water like he wanted. He said, pick up your bed and walk. In other words, you get up. Wow, you get up. And he did. In front of all those other people, they all could have got up. That's why when he was at the tomb of Lazarus, she said, Lazarus, come forth. If he had just said, come forth, everybody that ever died would have came walking out. Yeah. Hallelujah, he's God. Pick up your bed and walk. I think another cool thing about this, he did it on the Sabbath. He does stuff on the Sabbath. He healed the guy with the withered hand in the synagogue on the Sabbath just to tick everybody off. He had fun. He's fun. He's a fun God, too. Come on, in his presence is fullness of joy. If in his presence is fullness of joy, don't ever get a picture of some stern God looking down his nose at you. <laughs> Let's look at somebody sitting in the throne laughing and say, hey, <laughs> Glory to God. Oh, I'm so glad to have you here. Come boldly unto my throne room to obtain mercy, to find some grace. You want some grace? Hey, you want some grace? You want some grace? At my right hand, he said, it's pleasure forevermore. You want to get happy? You want to get happy? You want to get happy? Where did I say go next? Mark chapter 5. Because of the woman with the issue of blood, everybody knows her story. She was a certain woman. In verse 25, she was uh, sick for how long? 12, 12 years. And 12 is a whole other message we could preach, and we're not going to preach on 12 right now either because there's two 12s in this chapter. But, um, but here's this woman. She's been sick for 12 years, and she spent all of her money on medicine and doctors. I said, she spent all of her money on medicine and doctors, and thank God for doctors, but here in this case, the Bible says that she didn't get any better. She got worse. So not only was she sick, but now she's sick and broke. One thing to be sick is nothing to be sick and broke. Nothing good going for you. But then she heard about somebody. She didn't go down to the pool of Bethesda. She heard about somebody. She heard about Jesus. And the Bible says, and she said, and when you read it, it's continuous. She continued to say, if I can just, if I can just get a hold of, of those pomegranate balls on the end of his prayer shawl, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, because I read, I read Malachi chapter 4 that he would rise up with healing in his wings, healing in his prayer shawl. If I could just get to that prayer shawl, I know that I would be healed. And so then she comes out, and lo and behold, there's Jesus with Jairus the head guy of her synagogue and he's got the power to kill her because she's not allowed to be out in public because she's been bleeding for 12 years and she's supposed to be uh, I think 30 feet away from anybody and, and yelling out unclean 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 if he came tried to get too close to her so she hadn't had a hug she hadn't had a touch in a long long time other than a doctor and so here she is but she sees him but she's got her heart on it because faith We'll take in, faith is desperate. 
Faith is not wishing and hoping. Faith is, I'm getting this. You know, you can tell when somebody's a faith man, even when in praise and worship at the front of the church, they don't care whether you like the way they're praising God or not. They don't mind getting ugly for Jesus. They, they don't mind breaking a sweat. They're not looking at themselves to make sure everything is in place because they don't care anymore. All they care about is him. We sing about it with both time we do it. It's only about him. And so this woman, in order to touch the hem of his garment, you're going to have to get down on your hands and knees. And so here's in a crowd, he's being thrown by thousands of people, not just a few guys in bathrobes like you see in Bible stories. Thousands of people. Thousands of people. And he's on his way to Jairus' house, and she comes through that crowd, and she's been sick for 12 years, so she's frail. She, thought she didn't have any vitamin A, B, C, and D, and she didn't have any of that kind of stuff. She, she, all she had was a will to live. And so she pushed her way through the crowd, and she touched the hem of his garment. Mm. Let's, read, let's read a couple of verses here. Verse 27, it says, when she heard about Jesus. Come on, a crowd that size would be a problem for a healthy woman. Religion made her unclean like a leper. Public sentiment taught her to stay away from Jesus. But she heard the word, she spoke the word, she believed the word, she acted the word, and she got up. Look at it. She heard the word. She came in the press behind. She touched his garment and said, said, and said, and said, if I can just but touch his clothes, I'll be whole. And straight away, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was whole from her plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue or dunamis, that's the word dynamite, that's the word dynamo, that's the word explosive healing power of God. Dynamite had gone out of him. He turned to the crowd in the press and said, who touched me? His disciples said, there are a multitude of people in a multitude of churches all over Canada. Just a big crowd not touching them at all, but somebody by faith touched God. Didn't care about people anymore. Too desperate to think about that. Wanting something, not willing to stay in the wilderness anymore. Not willing to sit on a hot rock called Raphidim anymore. Not willing to stay in Kadesh Barnea anymore. Not willing to say, how about a little manna? Not willing to get up in the morning and try to scrape something off a rock so that you can have breakfast. Not willing to do that anymore because there's a land over there. There's a land that God told us about. It's overflowing with milk and honey. It's overflowing. It's the, the land of more than enough. It's the place where I'm supposed to live. It's the place that God designed for me to live. It's the place like the Garden of Eden was, and it was there for me. So I'm not staying in this desert, in this heat, hiding under the cloud anymore. I'm grateful for the cloud. I'm grateful for the manna. But, you know, when they crossed over, it says, on the morrow, the manna ceased. No more living by miracles. Now it's living by faith. No more living by a book of rules. Now it's living by faith. The just shall live by faith. I'm over there now. I'm over there now. Verse 34 is so powerful. Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace from your plague. Your he, I mean, it's interesting, too, he didn't say that in John chapter 5 to the other guy. He didn't say that to him. The other guy showed up at the temple, and there's an old side of the one getting that right now. So let's go to Joshua chapter 1. Every, every story has a path, a bunch of paths that will take you in a bunch of different places. It's, sometimes to stay focused is a challenge, you know. But see... But see, now, when, here in Joshua chapter 1, victory will be the result of a conquest. Now, now, uh, now I'm not going to have the manna every day. Now I'm not going to wait for another miracle, the healing of the waters, or water out of a rock, or quail in the desert. Now I'm going, now I'm going to take, now I'm, I've learned enough to take responsibility. 
because freedom isn't freedom until it's responsibility. It's like I said about apartheid in South Africa. I looked at it, and, uh, you know, Nelson Mandela was one of my heroes in this the world that we live in today, a, a heroic man and, and the things that he had gone through. But he brought deliverance to the people, but they, he couldn't bring freedom. Deliverance is okay, you've been delivered from your oppressor, but freedom doesn't happen until you start to think free. Freedom doesn't happen, you, you know, God made you to be a king, but until you, as long as you're thinking like a pauper, you'll never live like a king. Until you start thinking like a king, realizing that you have value, realizing that you have worth, realizing that you have purpose, realizing that God created you on purpose so that you could rule and reign in this earth, not beg, whine, and complain, but rule and reign in this life. That's, that's, the church needs to wake up to that. We're not, we're not beggars and paupers. We're priests and kings, a royal priesthood to show forth the praises of him that has called us out of the darkness and into this glorious light. Hallelujah. No, no, but here, now they're going to have to overcome opposition by force. They're going to have to press in and take possession of what God had already given them. Let's read a few verses here. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. Well, that's not good news for me if I'm Joshua. Joshua is a man that served Moses for 40 years. And, and now, and he's got 40 years of unfulfilled promises activated in his life. You know, 40 years earlier, read about him and Caleb. Let us go up at once. These people are nothing but bread for us. 40 years he had to wait un until all the unbelieving people died off before he could get his possession. So picture that, and, and now his best friend, his best friend in the whole world is dead. It's not a happy day. It's not, oh, I couldn't wait to get him out of the way so I could go do my own ministry. It was nothing like that, nothing like that at all. It was like, hey, my best friend is gone. <sighs> Hallelujah. I, 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 I stayed in the valley doing all the dirty work, but he was my best friend. He was my best friend. And now he's gone. So now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, and said, Moses, my servant is dead. Now rise up and go. Well, uh, could I just hang around the funeral parlor for like, like, what, like, rise up now and go. Across this Jordan. Now, when you read about the Jordan River, the Jordan River, when they cross it, when they cross it, he, the Lord doesn't do it in the dry season. Like you would think that he would have made it easy, right? No, we read the book of Joshua sometime. It says at flood stage, at flood stage, and then he told the priests, pick up the Ark of the Covenant. It's made out of gold. Gold is heavy. They got a gold box, two by four box, carried on staves. The priest back there and the priest back here. And he says, I want you to step into the river. And when you do, it'll part. <laughs> no, come on. You know, we, we like, you know, I'm a faith man. Really? Okay. <laughs> step off. And it wasn't this deep. It was deep enough that that gold box is going to take me to the bottom and the current is fast enough that when they find me, I'll be down there in the Dead Sea somewhere. At least down there, I'll be able to float. You'll be able to find my corpse. The Bible says that when the priest's foot hit the water, that it parted from the Dead Sea all the way back to the city of Adam. Interesting, Adam. Interesting. There's a whole other story in that from Romans chapter 5. But what really took place there is powerful. But here's Joshua. Here's Joshua. Now his leader is gone. Arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people with the land, into the land, which I do give to them, to the children of Israel. But look at verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I've already given it to you. Wherever you can step, it's the same thing he said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 14. Abraham, get up from where you are. 
Don't stay where you are, in other words. Get up from where you are. Look to the north, look to the south, look to the east and to the west. And he said, as far as you can see, I've already given it unto you. How far can you see? How far can you see? As far as you can see, that's how far you can go. This Bible. Every place the sole of your foot will tread upon, I've already given it unto you, just like I said to Moses. Well, in my case, it's Galatians 3.29. If any man be in Christ, he's Abraham's seed and heirs of the promise. So what he said to Abraham, I can relate to. For from the wilderness of Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, to the land of the Hittites, to the great sea, to going down to the sun shall be your coast. Now, when you draw that on a map, you see the cross laid out. Did you know that? When you draw the perimeter around what he just said, it's the cross. Everything goes back to the cross. Laid out flat. Look at verse 5. There shall not be any man able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. No man in Parliament Hill, no man in a dung hill, no man. What would you have me do then, Lord? Verse 6. Let the weak say, I am. Be strong and very courageous. Be strong and courageous. In the last days, men's hearts are failing them for fear. Fear has gripped everyone. Everybody's so angry. Anger is nothing but the fruit of fear. People are angry. Why? Because I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. And so, rah, rah, rah. Attack, attack. Men's hearts are failing them for fear, but it shouldn't affect us because he told Timothy, he said, Timothy, Timothy 1 and verse 7. It's 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7. Interesting that it's 2 Timothy because by now Timothy's preaching and there's members of his church missing because Nero's killing them off. And so God doesn't come along and say, oh, you poor little fella. I know you used to have 100,000 people in your church, and now you're down to 80, and the thing's dropping fast. He didn't say that at all. He said, I didn't give you a spirit of timidity. I didn't give you a spirit of fear. I give you a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Be bold. Come on, Acts 319, 29, they prayed for boldness. Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto your servants that with all boldness we may preach your word by stretching forth your hand to heal, letting signs and wonders be done by the name of the Holy One, Jesus. And when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. Be strong and of a good courage for unto this people you divide an inheritance in the land, which I swore unto their fathers to give unto them. Verse 7, he's going to say it again. He actually said it three times to Joshua over in the book of Deuteronomy, the last couple of chapters before we got here. He says it to him, I think, seven or eight times. You know, he, 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 why would he say it that many times? Huh? Do you think he might have been scared? No, 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 no. When, in, jo in Joshua chapter 6, they roll up on Jericho. Huh. And the Lord's there. An angel of the Lord's there and says, Behold, I've given unto you this city. The Bible says that Jericho was tightly shut up. None went out and none went in. And chariots raced on the top of the walls. This is a serious deal. Anybody here get a ladder? No, I got a step ladder. He's not my real ladder. No. No, they didn't, they didn't have a ladder. They didn't have any way to knock those walls down. They didn't have any way. They couldn't see any way. And now God's going to give them the dumbest plan you ever heard in your life. He's going to tell the women not to say a word for six days. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> That's the biggest miracle. That's as big as raising the dead. <laughs> All I'm saying is, Men speak 10,000 words a day. Women speak 50. Huh? What do you, what? what? 
I know. But when once the women said shut up, the men wouldn't say another word. Okay, let's just say it's going to be quiet at home when I get there, like it was at Jericho. <laughs> uh huh. This is for me, verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses your servant commanded you. Don't turn to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper, that you may prosper wherever you go, wherever you go. He said, I've told you, you know, you can, I told you, you can go as far as you want to. How far do you want to go? See, how far you go is, uh, is up to you. You, you make a decision, how, how much, you know, how much God do you want? I remember one time my pastor told me, you're exactly where you want to be in God. Made me mad. Until I thought about it. Who was he thinking he was going to tell me? You know, who do those pastors think they are anyways? Verse 8. God will make me a great success. No, no, that's not what it says. He says, this book of the law, or this word of God, we could say it this way for us. This word of the Lord shall not depart from out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. That word meditate means to mutter, to utter, to speak. So what I'm going to be talking about day and night, my problems. So really what he's saying here is don't let anything else come out of your mouth because your enemy will press you to get negative words to give him authority in your life. And so, Joshua, you cannot speak negative words out of your mouth, son. Son, if you want to go in and lead these people into the promised land, you can't speak negative words. You can't tell me all the reasons why it won't work when I ask you to get something done. You'll say, yes, sir, and then you'll figure out a way. Yes, sir, and figure out a way. Well, I don't think that can be done. That is a negative spirit. If it's on you, get it off you. It's from the devil. It's not from God. Why? Because the things that you pay attention to give momentum to your life. You give attention to the Word of God, it'll give you momentum. It'll keep you going. It'll keep you moving, even when things are negative around you. And again, Romans 8, 28 is, is really what faith is. I believe God that even when things look bad, that he's going to take the bad things the devil brought my way and turn them into something good. I don't believe that anything that comes against me is eternal because he told me the things that come against me are temporal, subject to change, and the things that I cannot see are eternal. Therefore, I walk by faith and not by sight. I'm not stuck in some place that I have to stay in for the rest of my life because I have a God. I have a God. In Psalm 121, I look toward the hills from whence does my help come from? It comes from God Almighty who never slumbers or sleeps. So if he doesn't slumber or sleep, I can go home and go to bed and have a good night's sleep because somebody's working on my problem. Problems come. Life is filled with problems. You're not ever going to be free of problems. You're not ever going to be free of problems coming against you. But what happens is you don't have to let them get in you. You don't have to let them affect you. You, you, as long when you be, learn how to trust in your loving God, the things that come against you, you can smile and say, I don't know how he's going to do it, but this thing is going to turn in my favor. Somehow this is going to all work out. Well, they came against me and this happened, and they came against me and that happened. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I pray for my enemies and those that despitefully use me because God's going to turn it around. Amen. Amen. So he said, see, Joshua is a real freedom fighter here. And he's saying, Joshua, I know what I put in you, and I know what I left out. I gave you what you need, what you need, and, what you, what, and the other things that you have need of, I put in the people around you. 
And somebody on Facebook the other day said, I don't believe in church anymore. I'm like the millennials. I, I just don't think church has lost its relevance. Well, read Corinthians chapter 12. Many members of a body. <laughs> Come on. You, you belong in a body. You can't function alone. You're a cancer cell if you're out there living off by yourself. And you think it's going to work long term? Well, then you know more than God, I guess. I only know what he says. He says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, that not forsake this, uh, your assembling of yourselves together, as some do, but even more as you see the end approaching. You know, the exact opposite has happened in the churches right across North America right now. There's less and less people in the midweek service because we're busy. We've got stuff to do. I mean, and, and I'm not denying it. We all got stuff to do. But the Bible tells me that I need this more and more, not less and less, as I see the end approaching. And I need, I, need, I need the word to get in me and on me, encourage me. Joshua, God will give you the favor you need for the season you're in. Joshua. Joshua, you freedom fighter, God will give you the favor that you need for the season that you're in. You got it. You got it. Hmm. Praise the Lord. I want to, cl I need, I need to go back to Mark 5 though. There's something I brought up on Sunday that needs to come out again. I think so. Because there's some, because you may have a problem close by that you have to deal with. Um, Jairus. Jairus, yeah, let's drop down to 5 and verse 38. It says that he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and there was a tumult, and the people wept and wailed greatly. They were having themselves a funeral, you know. And when he came in, he said to them, why are you, why are you making such a fuss? The woman is not dead. She's only asleep. They laughed him to scorn. But it says that he put them all out. And I wrote, him, I wrote in my margin that he needed to create an atmosphere for miracles. And so he had to throw... When you read one translation, it says that he threw them out. No, just like when he scourged the temple with the whip and all of that and turned over the tables. Th that was radical Jesus. That wasn't... You know, like he's serious about this. And so he, he put them all out. But I think in verse 41, it says, he took the damsel by the hand and said, uh, Talitha... Kumai, in which is interpreted damsel, I say unto you, arise. So I wrote in my margin, he had to get them out in order to get her up. Yes. And sometimes there's some things that you need to get out of your life in order for you to get up to the next place. Yes. And sometimes there's people. Yes. No, sometimes there's people that if you spend too much time with, I'm not talking about being mean and nasty. You know, we love everybody, but sometimes if you got somebody nagging, hanging, nagging and hanging around you and dragging you down, dragging you down, uh, you, you know, the Bible says to guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flow the issues of your life, the boundaries of your life. And so I, I find sometimes it's great to minister to people. But I remember one time when we first started the church, it was in our home over on uh, Wildwood Boulevard. And the women used to get together every Tuesday. And... Uh, and I was working in the chemical business, and like I was doing like 70,000 kilometers a year. I mean, I was, I was enjoying my job driving up and down the country and wherever they wanted me to go. Service call in Cape Breton, good, give it to me. And because I got a new tape series from Kenneth Hagin, I can listen to it on the way up and on the way back. And I love that kind of stuff. It was my Bible school for all those years. Anyway, when I, could, when I would come home on a Tuesday night after the women were together in my house, you'd have thought you'd walk in and say, oh, it's so holy in here. But no, it was nasty. All the time. All the time. And I found out later on that there was this one particular woman. One woman. Now, you'd have thought, well, you know, where's your Christian love? Christian love had to put her out because she wasn't sent by God. She was sent by the enemy of God to stir up strife and to cause negativity and, and just ruin the atmosphere that happened all the time. And so finally, finally we had to, you know, finally we had, to, we had to ask her to leave because she was hurting other people. Another time in here, we had this family. Their daughter, young daughter was, uh, 
uh, yeah, a lesbian. And, uh, and we wanted to help them. We wanted to help that family. We really wanted to help them. And so we met with him several times, and Pastor Paul and Shirley, I think, met with them a couple of times, and, and we tried to coach them. The next thing you know, this young girl was beginning to influence the other young girls in the church. And so we had no choice. Oh, well, you know, I know what they said about us after we did it. We're kind of blah, blah, blah. No, we had, we had to protect the people that were here. We didn't want to do it. We didn't want to be mean and cruel, but we had to do that. And sometimes you, you, have, to, you have to set a perimeter around your own life, too, you, you have to protect yourself and not allow people to drag you down. Especially when you notice that these people are down all the time. If they're having a down day and you pick them up, they can come and pick you up the next time you're having a down day. But if they're down all the time, Houston, we have a problem. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, Sometimes, the cool thing about being able, able to Google things is, I was thinking about that Nur Nuremberg trial today, and I, you know, I Googled it, and then like an hour later, I had to shut it up. Like, you know, you're in looking at all this. But you can find out everything. Like, you know, Sennacherib, who came in and, and uh, tried to destroy Israel, you know, with his army, and then the Bible says that an angel killed 85,000 of his soldiers overnight, and he went home. Well, you can go, you can Google his name and find a, a big cylinder uh, of his, from back 780 BC or whatever with his history on it. And in his history, it says that his soldiers died of some unknown plague overnight and he had to go back into, into was it Babylon? Yeah, I think it was the Babylonian Empire. Maybe it was not. Maybe it was the Syrian Empire. Anyway, when he went back, the Bible says that he was going to die at home. When he went back, his own sons killed him. And it's all there in history. And so whenever you look at history, all it does is prove. It, no, no, but what, when it proves the history, it proves your future at the same time. Huh? The guy was there at Bethesda for 38 years, and God was saying, just like they were in the, Jesus was illustrating to these guys, just like your, your family was there, there's a change, and I'm the change agent. Things are about to change. The change agent has arrived on the scene. Amen. And so, yeah, there was a time in the book of Esther where they didn't hear from God and they didn't name God and they felt like their prayers weren't being answered. And, and then suddenly, fear not, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God calls you an army. Look, at, look around yourselves. Would you call you an army? Huh? If you could see in the spirit realm, you would. Yeah, exactly. Elisha said, open up his eyes. Look at all the angels. Hmm. Praise God. If you need prayer tonight, we'd like to pray with you. If not, we're just going to go home.